heard you so many times. I think this is your best, outstanding song. I think we should give him a big hand. Uh, talking about digestion, now recently uh, in India this conversion is coming called inculturation, inculturation, right? And is this another form of uh, digestion? Where now they they follow now Mary Martha festival. They break coconut like Hindu. They put the garlic. Now they call it the Devaraya. Christ to Devaraya. Uh, everything they are imitating Hindus. And this is another form of digestion. Yes. Uh, the way digestion works is that the predator wants to remove and minimize the differences between his views and his style on the other side to create a comfort zone. So it is that, okay, I'm not different, I'm not European, I'm not English speaking, I speak Tamil and I speak Hindi and I'm very Bodhi and I do these things and I never women really have Bindi also and they, all of this stuff. And so to make you culturally comfortable and this idea is that outwardly we are like you but we have a different chip inside like it then has this, uh, what is the chip inside? <laughs> It used to be painted inside, but nowadays it is a better for me. Otherwise, I7. Okay, so uh, it's biblical, nice and clean inside, that chip. But outwardly, we break the coconut. We do all the things that make you happy. You want us to take our shoes in the church? We take our shoes. You want to uh, serve the secret and sacred food to Mother Mary and call it Prasad, you got it. Anything that doesn't violate the Nicene Creed will be taken. What violates the Nicene Creed has to be excreted, can't be consumed, eaten up by us, otherwise it's poison Christianity. And this inculturation is very dangerous because the whole lot of the our people are getting duped into it. They're getting duped into it. And our gurus who say everything is same, everything is same, means that, you know, you can't even argue there's something wrong with it, because they say it's the same. I have a relative who uh, had some economic problems, very well educated, he used to work for Luce and New Jersey, very, you know, smart guy, highly educated. He had some economic problems and family marital problems and all kinds of things and you know ours is not a very uh, community oriented where people get, get together and help somebody so he was sort of left on his own and then his problems worse and then people said he's talking weird and uh, I was the only guy who figured out there's some kind of religious thing going on in his head, religious shift in his head. He started, he would come to the uh, Indian marriage event very you know, call her like a priest, you know, Christian priest, we kind of like reading it out. And then he would say it's the same as Gita and Bhagavad Gita. All the other people were saying, don't worry, it's just uh, saying it's all the same anyway. It's not the And one day, <coughs> we were at a, somebody's birthday party in a restaurant, long table, a lot of people sitting, this guy was there. So I said, I looked at him straight in the eyes and I said, so, when did you get baptized? That was my question. <laughs> I just guessed that I probably have a, a new like that. And he was, he was eight, you know, February 7th, something like that. All the people around were struck. They said, how do you know? They could ask me. I said, I don't tell. I don't tell. So I didn't sound like I have a problem with it, with this guy. Because I didn't want to be the scene. So I said, ask him how wonderful these denominations. So he gave the name of the denomination. Then I started discussing the philosophy. And I said, we would read out the Nicene Creed. He said, yeah, we read out every day. And all that he was telling me. And then, he came to my house for a private discussion because he thought maybe Najib got me figured out and I'll talk to him and maybe we'll be together, maybe he thought he's going to work with us. <coughs> so, when we were having this private discussion, I said that, you know, your kids are complaining, your wives are complaining, you're, you're not disconnected with the tradition, your parents you told them, haven't even told them, to, they've also been wondering, so why? So he says that since I was born, I was a kid, everyone told me it's all the same. He said, how, how, why are my parents going to complain? Every time I call, they say, sir, wait up. We believe in all the things. Everybody's saying, so now I tell them that we are all the same. What's your problem? He said, 
Suraj. And half the Indians in our gathering, in that group, all visited the Hindus, half of them said, actually, you believe in what you want? What? So we got really confused. We got really confused. You, until you can get into the cause of the problem, which is the important to be different. What is your identity? Who are you? Why is that matters? Unless you understand that, it's a losing battle. Because you can keep arguing all you want about preserving tradition and all that, but they don't get it. They think that, okay, my kids grow up and, you know, ask is just another path. All paths lead to the same goal. All, you know, truth is one, God for many days. We heard that this morning also. So this confusion is the cause that we can never get mobilized. Another question?
So a huge opportunity for me is to penetrate the gurus and acharyas, those who are interested. Some of them are threatened by me because they think what I'm saying will make it look like they themselves are ignorant. So I have tried to get into the door to have one-on-one -on -one meeting with the top guy in many, many places. If anyone can get me with uh, Jati Vasudev, his bodyguards around him are protecting him, not wanting to access, you know, CC, uh, even though I know him. A lot of these gurus, they feel that, uh, you know, in their whole uh, name they made based on a huge international cloud. You know, the point is that if you really start poking into the details, they have a kind of superficial knowledge. They really don't understand the whole function of the West. And when they argue why should we study the West and all that, I tell them that your tradition is to study the other, that is called the whole function. It's just that for the last thousand years, since West, since Islam came, we didn't do poor function, since Christianity came, we didn't do poor function with Marxism and Enlightenment and all these Western, uh, you know, secularism came, we did not do proper poor function and we are paying the price. Without poor function, our tradition would have died because of this sort of problem. We, we, the poor function of the methodology of understanding the other on our terms, being able to answer him, to create a difference, understanding difference, being different, so that we don't get digested. Poor function is our methodology. It's a very solid Hindu methodology and our people need to get back into that. So I'm, if there's one thing I want to do, I want to establish a tradition, revive a tradition of Puru Paksh in our, in our Sampradayas, in our Guru images, and Puru Paksh in our Buddhist because they're not threatening us. Puru Paksh of Western thought, Puru Paksh of Islamic thought is what we have to do. Maoist thought, we have to do Puru Paksh on our terms and how to answer that. Yeah? So to me, that is, those institutions of religion, of our Dharmic centers would be the most important. Then I'm trying to get into academics. I'm trying, because they are, that's where the college people are brainwashed. And academics, both in the US and in India, keep uh, having talks and put them up on YouTube and so on. Uh, academics would be a great thing. And then, uh, you know, organizations like this, where at least the people are already into Dharma. Now they need to learn more about it. So, People who come here, I don't have to explain to them and argue for dharma. They already are. I just have to explain to them, educate them about the whole function of the other civilizations, how to talk back, how to answer back, how to explain our side to them. So that's a very good one. Media would be fantastic, but I don't know how to get in. They don't want a guy like me because I'm not Shahrukh Khan and I'm not some cricket guy and I'm not into some political scandal and I'm not, you know, I am not the kind of gossip masala which they are looking for. So their attention span in a few seconds and I have nothing to say in a few seconds. I mean I just don't. So that's my answer. But how they did it is irrelevant. The point is they are knocking at my door and they like to get me. 
that's what matters. Now, the, the real question you ask is, if humanity is to live as one, we need a coexistence architecture. We need an open architecture where all civilizations and cultures and diversity can coexist. The Western universalism does not have a track record of diversity surviving. For a little while, yes. But eventually, after, after a certain amount of time goes by, their language is gone, destroyed, their dry dress and lifestyle is destroyed, it all gets digested into Western universalism. We just have a look at the past. India, on the other hand, has a very long history of a universalism which respects the diversity of others because when they come, they do not. The Syrian Christians did not stop being Syrian Christians, the Zoroastrians did not stop being Zoroastrians, the people of different languages and different kind of traditions did not stop. Now you have to ask, why is it, this is a question that all of you, I have answered in this book with homework with assignment, I am giving you, if you read the book to answer this question. Why is it that when there is change in Western religion, the previous one has to be destroyed for the next one to be valid? Yeah? Like, when you install Windows 8, then you have to uninstall Windows 7. <laughs> yeah? You can't have both running. Whereas, we may have a rat temple from way back, and nobody has gone and said you must convert and get rid of that and upgrade to the next release. So we can have people doing Tantra, we can have people doing Advaita, we can have somebody, somebody Bhakti of one and somebody Bhakti of another. We have people of many strata, many uh, historical times, old, uh, you know, old uh, faiths, new faiths, newer faiths, newer faiths, and yet they all coexist. Why is it that in our case, for the new release to be valid, they don't want you to uninstall the previous release? That can also live with you. Very interesting. Very interesting. Even the same family. You may be practicing something, which is called like a new kind of a thing that is evolved in our dharma. And your mother may be practicing something else, your grandmother may be practicing something else. Nobody would say that you must you make everything uniform and bring it all to mind. What? This is a very important question answered philosophically. Why from the other side it is necessary to have this uniformity, one, one, no diversity of views allowed. Why can't I have an issue they've of this kind, that kind, that kind in those religions? Even on themselves. Why is it there like we have so many united, unified uh, temples like this one with so many devtas? Why couldn't you put Mary and then put something about the Kaaba and then put some Jesus, uh, 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 you know, Star of David? And even among the Abrahamic religions, why couldn't you have a unified house of worship? You can't. There is a philosophical reason why the validity of X, the legitimacy of X, requires falsifying Y. You have to falsify Y, otherwise you are not legitimate. This is not an easy, it's not a map that they are bad guys. This is a requirement by edict. Requirement. You must understand it very detail. So pluralism and multiculturalism within Western universalism is a facade. Within the Western secularism, you can tolerate, you can tolerate others. Tolerance is an insult. Tolerance means you are no good, but I put up with you. <laughs> You're going to hell, but you know what I put up with you. It's an insult if somebody says, I tolerate you to have dinner next to me. Sit next to me, you eat dinner, I tolerate you. What an insult. You say, what's wrong with me? Why do I tolerate you? Our turn is mutual respect. Mutual respect for difference is a very different concept than tolerance. When you ask a Christian, what is your policy on uh, you know, pluralism? What is your policy on those who are not Christians who are doing something different? And they will say with great pride and uh, with great pride is oh we have a policy of tolerance. This way. You say, yeah, but in your office would you like someone to say I tolerate you next to me? You, in your house, suppose your spouse says I tolerate in the house. <laughs> it's an insult. It's an insult. I have many stories in the I give you some stories very interesting. I was invited to a major uh, university in California starting a World Religions uh, Center and they wanted a member of each religion to come and they wanted to declare peace and harmony and have dialogues. This was the 1990s. So they put me on the board of advisors as a Hindu. And when they were launching this 
He went to this place where all the dean came and vice chancellor and provost, all these guys were there. So they were all giving speeches. And they were they drafted a resolution that all these religions that are represented hereby pledge to have tolerance towards each other. So when it was my turn, I said, I proposed. I was the only guy who actually disagreed. They all agreed and they all clapped. I said that I would like to request one change. Remove the word tolerance and put in the word mutual respect. I said the difference is, if I respect you, I respect your legitimate. If I really tolerate you, I think you're no good, you're evil, you're going to hell, but I put up with you. <laughs> and, and I want mutual respect. Now this gave me a big stir. Uh, after this, uh, I, I, I had to leave for personal reason, I came back home. I got a call from this lady who was head of this whole organization. She called me and she said, Raji, you really created a big commotion. I said, what did I do? He said, you asked for this mutual respect. They all, now they are debating whether we can do it or not. <laughs> so I went and told this to Swami Dhanan Saraswati. I should be good enough. Many of you call him one. He said, that's a good idea. We should want your mutual respect. So then, year 2000, was the United Nations declared a millennium summit. Some of you might remember. Uh, all the leaders of religious, uh, leaders of all the world religions were invited by the United Nations. Baba Jain was head of that group. And under Kofi Annan, they were going to declare world peace and uh, you know, all the religions will have harmony and all that. And this millennium will be the millennium of peace. That's what will happen. So, there was a resolution uh, which had been drafted. And uh, in the resolution, it said uh, that we all declare tolerance for each other. So Swami Dhanan Saraswati, since everybody had to approve, he crossed out and put mutual respect. And then the Vatican guy, when he would get it, he would cross it out and put all this. <laughs> and this went on. And New York Times reported uh, that uh, there is a serious risk, there is a deadlock of language, of technical language, people are good, they didn't, they didn't give details. And therefore there is a there is a real risk that the, the, the uh, summit may collapse without a resolution and it will be a big uh, embarrassment for the United Nations. So this went on and they kept putting pressure on Swamiji. Swamiji put his dummy leaves and said, no, I want much respect. All is my brain. So at the eleventh hour, the Vatican blinked and they passed the resolution with much respect. And everybody thought, wow, this is very good. <laughs> but, but the story is done then and there. <laughs> About a month later, after everybody's got back in their home, the Vatican issues a clarification, hmm. official. It, and the uh, head of the Vatican delegation was Cardinal Ratzinger, who oh. later became Pope, Pope Benedict, the current Pope. So it's not a small fry. He was a big shot even then. He was head of the Vatican's you know, external affairs. Anything to do with the outside world, interfere, and whatever. He was head of that. Then he later became Pope Benedict. Changes in the Pope Benedict. He was called Cardinal Bradshaw. He's the one. So he's the one.